I Survived the Shark Attacks of 1916. Today we're going to be reading actually two chapters, chapters 8 and 9, but you're going to keep the same job for both of them. Chapter 8. Chet scrubbed himself off in the creek and went back to Uncle Jerry's cottage. It was too hot to be inside, so he sat on the porch. He sat there a long time. He wondered what Mama and Papa were doing. He pictured Mama with her soft smile and laughing eyes and Papa, who always woke up with a happy face, even when they were out of money and had to pack up and start all over again. Why had they left him here? He was so deep in his gloomy thoughts that at first he didn't see Uncle Jerry hurrying up the walk. There you are, he said, catching his breath. He sat down next to Chet. I thought you were going to be at the diner all day, Chet said. I was, Uncle Jerry said, fishing in his pocket for his pipe. He struck his match on the floor, lit the pipe, took a few puffs, and then settled back. They didn't say anything for a few minutes. So there was some excitement at the creek, I hear, Uncle Jerry said. Chet's heart sank into his boots. Poor Dewey came running down Main Street in his drawers, Uncle Jerry continued. He was screaming about the creek devil. His mama called on, er, Dr. J. Chet sighed. He didn't look at Uncle Jerry. He probably already sent a telegram to Mama and Papa and was getting ready to ship Chet directly to California. Chet couldn't wait to start packing. I went too far, Chet said. I guess you did, Uncle Jerry said. Chet took a deep breath. A spider scurried across the floor and disappeared into one of the cracks. Lucky spider. There was a strange sound. Chet looked at Uncle Jerry's, whose face was beet red. Was he choking on his pipe smoke? No, he was laughing. His laughter exploded through the air. He pounded his chest a few times. Sorry, he said through his guff-offs. But that look on Dewey's face, he leaned forward, slapping his leg, shaking his head. It was a good one. Uncle Jerry sputtered. Maybe a little too gruesome, but darned good. Chet wanted to laugh along with Uncle Jerry, but he kept thinking of that furious look on Sid's face when Chet came out of the water. Monty was right. Chet wasn't worth it. He wasn't even worth a punch in the nose. He had ruined everything. Tears ran down his face. He turned away from Uncle Jerry, but it was too late. Uncle Jerry stopped laughing and put his hand on Chet's shoulder. He waited for Chet to stop crying. What a fool he was blubbering like this over a stupid prank. It's all right, Uncle Jerry said. No, Chet said, standing up. I need to leave. Where are you going, Uncle Jerry said. To California, Chet said. Uncle Jerry stared at him. I don't belong here, Chet said. The heck you don't, Uncle Jerry said. You belong here, like I knew you would. Why do you think I begged your mama to let you stay with me? But I thought mama had asked you. Chet said. Are you kidding? I've been begging her for years. I wrote about a hundred letters, a few telegrams too. Why? Chet said. Uncle Jerry looked at Chet like he'd ask for the answer to two plus two. I thought maybe you were tired of moving around so much, Uncle Jerry said, pulling Chet back down to sit next to him on the porch step. And there's another reason. You and I are buddies, kiddo. Always were. I was lonely without you all these years. Chet almost laughed. With all the people who loved Uncle Jerry, who crowded around him every day at the diner, who laughed at his jokes and listened to his story, how could he be lonely? Yet Uncle Jerry's eyes, usually all crinkled up and merry, were big and serious. He meant it. Did I ever tell you what happened after I hurt my leg, Uncle Jerry said? I moved to New York City. I quit this town. I just wanted to get lost. I couldn't stand the way people looked at me here, like they pitied me. Or like I'd let them down not by not becoming a big baseball star. Mama never told me that, Chet said. Well, it's true. But you know what? I miss this place, and I'll tell you what I learned. A person has to face up to things. You never solve anything by running away. Chet knew Uncle Jerry was right. But how could Chet stay here with the guys hating him so much? Uncle Jerry seemed to read his thoughts. You'll find a way to make it up to those friends of yours, he said. I know you will. Chapter 9 the next two days at the diner, Chet kept waiting for the guys to come in. Every time the door opened, he looked up, hoping to see them, elbowing each other to be the first to the counter. They never even walked by. Chet kept trying to work up the nerve to go and find them, and finally, on Wednesday, he was ready. 
It was another scorching day, the hottest yet. After the lunch rush was over, Uncle Jerry decided to close the diner early. All the ice in the restaurant had melted. The milk had curdled. You could just about cook a flapjack on the kitchen floor. I'm going home to stick my head under the water pump, Uncle Jerry said. Then I'm going to swing in our hammock until the sun sets. Chet said goodbye to Uncle Jerry and headed to the creek. Sure, he'd find the guys playing ball in the water. But the swimming hole was quiet. Chet realized they were still at the factory. Their shift wouldn't be over for an hour. While he was waiting, he noticed that there were still splotches of ketchup on the dock. They looked even more like blood now, like evidence of a gruesome crime. He decided to try to clean them before the guys got here to erase all reminders of his prank. He undressed and jumped into the creek. Then he splashed water up on the dock, hopped out of the water, and scrubbed the stains with a handful of leaves. It took three rounds of splashing and scrubbing to clean it up, but then Chet was so hot he decided to take a longer swim. It was peaceful here without everyone splashing and shouting. He floated on his back under the trees, remembering how Papa had taught him to swim in Mississippi. How Mama sat on the banks, waving and clapping. He had turned to swim back to the dock when, crash, he hit something under the water. Or something hit him. Hit him so hard in the chest he couldn't breathe. What was that? An old dock plank? A snapping turtle? Had Sid sneaked to him, up on him and smacked him? The water around him looked funny, like it was filled with red smoke. Chet looked down in shock. His entire chest was scraped and oozing blood. What could have done this to him? A cold terror rose up inside him. He suddenly had the feeling that someone or something was nearby watching him. And then he saw it. A gray fin. It glistened in the bright sun as it glided slowly toward him. He had to be seeing things. Or could this be another prank? Were the guys getting him back? But no, this was no tile. As it got closer, Chet could see the dark shape of an enormous fish bigger than him, even bigger than Uncle Jerry. Two black eyes peered up through the water. Chet's heart stopped. Killer eyes. Chet took off toward the shore, pounding through the water, kicking with all his might. Finally, his feet touched the bottom. He was running now, his heart hammering, a voice booming through his mind. Get out of the water, get out of the water, get out of the water. Almost there, just a few more steps. He dove forward, landing hard in the dirt. He rolled onto his side and stared in disbelief. It was a shark, a massive shark, dirty gray on top and pure white underneath. Its jaws snapped open and closed. The teeth, jagged and needle sharp, were bigger than Chet's fingers, lined up in rows and curving inward. The shark thrashed as if trying to paw, push itself up onto the bank. Chet wanted to get up and run, but he was frozen to the ground. Those killer eyes stared unblinkingly at Chet. And then, with a flick of its tail, the shark thrust itself backward into the water. It hovered for a second on the surface. Then, with a whoosh of its tail, it disappeared back down the creek. Yikes, time to do your job. You'll do the same job for both of those chapters.